everybody. Welcome to the True Presbyterian. This is season three, and we are deep into the season now, and my guest today is Mr. Eric Kahn. So Eric is a graduate, I believe, of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. Is that right? I attended there for about four years. I did not finish my Master of Divinity, but uh, I, okay. did, I did go there for, yeah, about four years. Okay, so he attended Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, much like I attended Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary, <laughs> and he is also the host of the uh, Hard Men podcast, which is available on, well, pretty much any podcasting app that you like. So, Eric, thank you so much for joining me, and welcome to the show, brother. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you, and uh, I'm kind of excited about this one. So I want to start just kind of setting the stage for my listeners. Sure. And uh, this may sound like a very basic question, but it's one that I think kind of needs to be asked so that we can clear the ground first. Uh, is there a downgrade happening in the Christian church in general uh, and in, uh, let's say, Reformed and Presbyterian churches more specifically? Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's, uh, broadly speaking, just a, a downgrade in the sense of feminization, um, which shows up in a couple ways. You see the feminization in the church and also in the culture. Um, and we'll, we'll unpack some of this, I'm sure. But but a lot of people, actually secular authors, have written about this too. Um, you can see the advance. Usually they're praising it, right? It's an advance uh, in feminism. That's affected corporate mm -hmm. America. It's affected literally every facet and area of life. And I think, broadly speaking, too, we've changed what we think of culturally as the prototypical man. Like, what's... What's the ideal man? It used to be the rugged guy. It used to be the strong guy, um, someone who spoke yeah. plainly. Now it's the nice guy. He's a doormat for women. Um, we've really seen this, too, especially in the church, right, with the complementarian movement and mm. especially egalitarianism, right? The guy that we espouse, this is the guy you want to be. He's nice. He's sensitive. He listens to women's feelings, and then he lets her decide, you know, what the family's going to do. So I, see, I think we've seen that, but— also, we've seen kind of the downgrade of masculine virtues. So mm -hmm. masculinity in general is now toxic. Um, things that, you know, 20, 30 years ago we said, look, these are virtues of masculinity, a certain aggression under control, taking and bearing responsibility. This is what men are for. And now if you say that, well, you're a chauvinist pig and you're espousing toxic masculinity, uh, we've seen this with things like the Gillette commercials. Um, it was it was a big deal, oh, yeah. right? Because it was like men are mean and men need to be nice like women are nice. And I think overall what it all amounts to is there's a blurring of gender distinction. We want, you know, mm. in my lifetime, the, the way that transgenderism has gone just through the roof in terms of how often it's pushed in your face culturally, mm -hmm. um, even, even guys like uh, J.D. Greer telling us that, you know what, Christians, we need to use preferred pronouns. Um, and so you're really seeing just more and more blurring every day. And I think why it happens in the church is because pastors don't want to preach and teach on gender distinctions from Scripture. So that's kind of the, the overall environment as I see it. Right. And so we're talking specifically about kind of uh, feminization of culture and how it relates to maybe feminization within the church, but it, it goes deeper than that. Sure. So you did an episode on the Hard Men podcast, um, I don't know, maybe about six months ago, I'm not entirely certain, where you were talking about the feminization of the pulpit and the feminization that we've seen with pastors. And so if you wouldn't mind, I'd like you to kind of uh, drive down that street a little bit for my listeners and talk about what you see happening there. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a, it's a great question. Well, it kind of started out because I was I was reading Ann Douglas's book, which is the feminization of American culture. So she really it's an excellent book. Yeah, and she does a phenomenal job, really unpacking from early eighteen hundreds to nineteen hundreds how church and culture kind of working together, sort of like became more feminized. But a lot of it had to do with the interplay between women in the culture and the clergy. So as I was mm -hmm. thinking about that, reading through that book, I really wanted to delve more into the pastoral side and some of the things that I had seen happening. Um, I had read also, kind of connecting the dots here with a few different things, but like in Mother Kirk, Doug Wilson talks about how, uh, I think he refers to them as pastors in skirts. Like we're, we really open the door 
for the culture to go feminist because that's what was happening in pulpits. It started with a downgrade in theology, and then that really just opened up the door for not only women to be in the pulpit, but for the men who were in the pulpit to really be acting like women. You got very emotionalistic preaching and teaching, and Mm -hmm. um, this has really shaped the way our churches are today. So you think about the mainline, the really big uh, churches, they're they're really like an entertainment, going to a concert or something like that. So very emotive. Um, they want to they want to work mm-hmm. mostly on your emotional response. You're not participating in the singing, and then the messages are they're very feel good. They're emotionally driven. They're not really bound mm. by like strong logical theological treatises. Um, and this was really something that I, I latch onto because Ann Douglas brought the point up, but she said. When Calvinism dies, then masculinity dies with it, and the church dies. You don't have—and this is from a feminist perspective, by the way. Um, mm-hmm. And she's saying, look, masculinity and Calvinism were tied together because when the men were leading the church, they had robust the- theology. Uh, men are by nature more logical, rational. Women tend to be more emotional, nurturing, conflict mm-hmm. avoiders. And so she documents this in the book, how when women took over in the church, theology went out the window and it all became like feel good emotionalism, devotional style uh, teaching in the church. So, again, that's stuff that we see today. um, And I think because of that, you know, you have pastors now who are effeminate in the sense of like they won't discipline the flock because they don't want to upset anybody. Um, Mm. Just the emotional language. Um, I always come back to stuff that J.D. Greer said because he is he's really slick with his words. Um, This is the SBC president. Um, And he'll say things like, you know what, guys, we should not shout about homosexuality where the Bible whispers. And then you start as a man, you start unpacking this and you're like, (laughs) wait a minute. The Bible whispers about homosexuality. I mean, we're told repeatedly that if if anyone practices these things, that they will be destroyed for all eternity. Like, the Bible seems yeah. pretty loud and clear about it. Why is this guy saying that it whispers? And he wasn't, like, pointing to a text. Right. He wasn't expositionally preaching right. from a passage. Again, it's it's very emotive. Yeah, uh, God tossing flaming road tar out of heaven to <laughs> destroy an entire city. That seems really whispery to me. I don't know. God's whispering. Yeah, Sodom and Gomorrah. That yeah. was uh, if that's God whispering, I don't, I don't want to know what his shouting actually sounds like. Yeah. I, so in that vein, and this is this is kind of a, a follow up or, or to drive down that road. Um, one of the things that that I intend to ask is is about kind of how this downgrade started and how it progressed. Um, and, and you've touched on that a little bit. Now, I know that Ann Douglas wants to trace it to, you know, the, the early 19th century. Sure. Uh, maybe even the late 18th century, kind of depending on where uh, you land there. Where I believe it's Leon, is it Potels or Pottles? I don't yeah, know how Leon to pronounce Potles. his last name. Um, wants to drive that all the way back into really medieval mysticism. Sure. Uh, and, and I do think he's on to something there because if you look at. It's some of the actually let me back that up. Um, if you were to look at it, I don't encourage you to go gazing upon Second Commandment <laughs> violations. Uh, but if you were to look at paintings of Christ from, uh, let's say, actually, in, in this case, I would say 19th century Spain yeah. uh, during a romanticist period, the images of Christ that you see painted are very feminine. Right. I mean, he's very doughy eyed, very willowy. And, and I do think that there's something to that. So from from your perspective, what do you think? Are we, or do we really see this this downgrade driving all the way back into the medieval period, or do you think Ann Douglas is is kind of coming down in the right place? And then, as a follow up to that, how have you seen this progress, kind of as, as you've looked at the church and the situation in it? Well, the first thing that I would say is that feminization goes all the way back to the garden. So, I mm. mean. You know, this is something where Eve is like, you know, the first thing that she's tempted with is don't don't believe your husband, don't believe God, like try to lead him. Um, God doesn't know what he's doing. This authority structure that God set up, it, it doesn't work. And so you're going to have to step in, Eve, and you're going to have to take charge of your of your man. And um, <laughs> however you interpret that in Genesis, I, I think a right interpretation is that you, her desire will be for the man in the sense of it's going to create contention in their relationship and she's going to want to rule in some capacity. 
certainly mm-hmm. we can say like I can say this pastorally having counseled men and women that's like one of the core struggles of every marriage right she wants to be in charge there's a tension in the marriage so in one sense I think it's cyclical throughout uh, human history and what we see is just different waves where maybe the men are stronger and it's more patriarchal I think the big difference um, is that in more modern times, I think we sort of have this anomaly of hyper feminism. Mm. Um, so you can look mm-hmm. at all of human history and a lot of it is because look in the past, like warring cultures had to fight each other to survive. Like they were not as posh, luxurious and affluent as we are today. This is an anomaly. Right. And so because of that, we are allowed to be soft. Whereas past cultures, it, it, it would not have happened at all because Look, you had to defend the perimeter. You had to kill people. And it really came down to like, people are invading. We have to kill them or we're going to be killed. And that was human history for the most part until, you know, the last like decade, um, last two decades where now we're just mm. getting in wars because we're bored and we want their money and we need their oil and their money. So we're <laughs> right. going to go to war with them. So. I, I think you follow those cycles throughout history. It has definitely gotten worse in the last 200 years. I also, however, do agree with Leon Podols. I don't think that you can trace the feminization uh, based on his data to just, just 1800s in America. And and I say that because, well, Europe is equally feminized. Um, they sure. have a lot of those problems too. Pretty much, Leon Podols drives a good point, I think, that it's really the Western church that is experiencing yeah. this problem. Eastern Orthodox are not having the problem as much. Now, granted, Eastern Orthodox is not exactly booming. Um, yeah. But Judaism, Islam, those are still... And I would just say, look, that's because those are the leftover patriarchal religions. And Christianity used to be that way. Um, certainly, I think Podols is right. The I read that book and like what his... His examples of bridal mysticism um, and what happened when nunneries, you know, it used to just be you had monks and church fathers. They were very manly guys. But then, you know, you put the Mm. theology in the hands of women, really. Your your heavy influence on theological understanding is from women. And it gets very weird, especially when you do on biblical things like tell people not to get married and then they're like having fantasies yeah. about Christ, you know, and then trying to say that like that is your emotional, relational, religious experiences is, is tied up in that. So, yeah, overall, just to summarize all that, I would say that it's it's historical and cyclical. However, I do think uh, the last 150 years, particularly, we, we are a really, really bad example. The irony of all that is that we think, oh, we're so enlightened. Those were the dark <laughs> ages. These, these right. now we're illuminated, and I think it's actually completely the opposite. Yeah, I, um, I had a conversation with somebody not long ago that uh, said, you know, I, I don't think we have any idea how fortunate we are uh, that we really can't wrap our minds around the fact, like, mm. at, at the most basic level of things that we do every single day. So you walk into your house or you walk into a room in your house and you hit a light switch and the lights come on. Yeah. Every time, you know, unless, of course, something happens like this, you know, catastrophic event that we're seeing right now in Texas. Right. Um, But as a general rule, you hit the light switch, the lights come on. The plumbing always works. And that is such a rarity in human history. Right. And so we, we, we don't have, historically, we don't have a category for that. Um, and so, yeah, it does make sense how we see that downgrade. And in, in keeping with that, and you weren't warned about this question, uh, you're rocking a hoodie right now that says Wilderness Warrior. That's right. Uh, and that is a question I'm going to ask right now. So I am convinced that the reason that we're not seeing a masculinity crisis, particularly in the Russian Orthodox Church, is because they still have a category for Christ as warrior. Yeah. And so I'm wondering kind of what do you where would you land on that? Is is that's is that one of the flaws that you see in the Western church? Yeah, absolutely. And um yeah, so Wilderness Warrior, that's one of my other podcasts that we started, really in the same vein of taking really taking the Hard Men podcast, taking masculinity, and then how do we create like a group for guys 
sort of like the Boy Scouts used to be. I was an Eagle Scout. Mm -hmm. But, like, how do we actually train men in the wilderness to be warriors for Christ? And, and, and a lot of it relates back to Scripture, because what do people always say? They, if they don't like the Hard Men podcast, they don't like masculinity, they always tell me, yeah, but Jesus was nice, Eric. He was meek. And then we have to get into discussions about meek doesn't mean uh, a doormat. Meek means a controlled, powerful being um, who mm. is, he's controlled. At times he uh, binds together a whip of cords and he drives people out of the temple. It's probably not the picture of Jesus that you have when you think of meek, but that is a meek Jesus. Right. So, and then it, it really relates to scripture. I started just adding these things up. How many passages in scripture do we have language like fight the good fight, take up the sword of faith, put on the, the armor of faith, you know, all the shield, the helmet, of, the belt plate, you know, all this stuff. It's the number of times, you know, Paul says that I, I don't run the race with no end. I, I run for a goal, for a prize. I don't, you know, he compares mm. it to boxing. So you start thinking about mm -hmm. this, and actually the Christian faith is very manly. Um, it's something very, very nicely unpacked in Zach Garris's book, Masculine Christianity, um, which I don't, I don't know if you've read that just yet. Just a second, folks. Zach is joining us on the podcast. Uh, these episodes are not recorded in order, so this is being recorded before the uh, interview with Zach, uh, but it will air afterwards. So if you guys are listening to this when it airs, you need to go back and listen to that episode with Zach Garris. Uh, because I know that one's going to be good because his book was yeah. excellent. Yeah. So Zach's book is is phenomenal, really addresses a lot of these things. Zach and I have talked quite a bit and I've had him on my show. He he really unpacks this stuff so well. Uh, but, yeah, mm -hmm. we've really lost the sense of a church militant. Um, yes. In, in particular, I would go back to and just say, look, if you start singing the Psalms like. God is a man of war, and the Psalms are like military battle hymns. You think about the Battle of Jericho, the peoples of God marching and singing, and singing and chanting is bringing down the walls of Jericho and of the enemy. And I think what we need to recapture mm -hmm. is in the churches, men need a mission, men need a battle cry, and that Scripture is that thing. Like, Scripture is not mm. fundamentally about, and Christianity is not fund fundamentally about, how do I have this deeply romantic, like tantric time with God alone in my closet? Christianity is about a deep relationship with mm. Christ, but it always results in dominion warfare and dominion work. So even when you think of like an Ephesians 2, I was reading that this morning, right? We, we are saved by grace. This is amazing. It's wonderful, but that's not the end of the story. We're saved unto good works. And God has these mighty works that he's mm -hmm. laid out for his people and go take dominion and fill the earth with the glory of Christ. Men need that um, if we're going to recover a, a vibrant, really just a vibrant church, a church on mission. Yeah, I appreciate the piece about singing the Psalms. I am an exclusive psalmist, so I'm always happy to hear yeah. people talk about singing the Psalms. It's funny, our, our Huguenot forebears, when they were facing persecution in France, and were having to fight for their right to gather to worship. And by that, I don't mean they were having to protest against the government. I mean, they were legitimately fighting uh, swords and right. spears and shields and the whole nine yards. And when they would march into battle, they would sing Psalm 68. Oh, man. May God arise and by his might put all his enemies to flight. Mm. Um, so there are these war songs that are part of our history and the Reformed faith, and we just neglect them. Um, and I get that there, there are uncomfortable pieces of some of these psalms that we don't like to talk about. I uh, you know, may take their little ones and dash them against the rocks. Um, and yet, these are the songs of God. And so, right. I, I mean, the, the, the whole Jesus is my boyfriend singing just yeah. drives me nuts. And, and we wonder why men don't want to sing in church. Yeah, it really is. I so, mean, I, I've thought that for a long time. Um, and I, I grew up in kind of the... Uh, you know, the mainline evangelical churches really was part of when I was saved, brought into the church, converted. You know, I was really part of like an emergent church. And same here. It, it was crazy because what happened was I was like, I went there and I was like, this is really shallow. I was also a philosophy major. So it was like I was really wanting to delve into the questions. 
And it wasn't until mm-hmm. I got into Reformed Calvinism that I was like, wait a minute, there are some people in the past of Christianity who had some theological mental horsepower. Like, it wasn't yeah. just this... I mean, I was thinking of a song that we used to sing in that church, and it was it was called, like, Your Love is Extravagant. And I, yeah. I can't tell if that's like a... Like you said, like, is this about somebody's girlfriend? Your fragrance is intoxicating. Like, I, I'm like, what is this? What is this even about? A lot of them, though, we called them 7 Eleven songs. You know, you have seven words that are yeah. repeated 11 times. Sure. Um, and, and it was, wasn't really until like I got into the Reformed faith and, you know, God of vengeance, O Jehovah. It's like, hmm. They've thought through their doctrine. These people are passionate. And then you start realizing we have this great historic faith where, um, you know, whether it's Ambrose, like barring the doors of the church from the state and being like, you're not coming in here. We're mm-hmm. worshiping and you're not in charge. Jesus is king. You know, like we, we right. desperately need that. And I think that's the beauty, the beauty of 2020 and 2021 right now. People are waking up really in my life for the first time I'm seeing. People are realizing like, yeah, I tell you what, when the government's right. coming after you and beating you down your door, you do not need nice guys. You need guys who will bar the door and be ready for a fight, you know? And yeah, we, uh, largely absolutely. in the church, we don't have that. No, we really don't. And um, as we as we kind of consider the downgrade and we consider kind of think or continue, I should say, kind of thinking about this, can you give us just some really clear examples of the sort of downgrade that we're talking about? So for me, the one that comes to mind is the ballet performance at uh, Redeemer, New York City uh, under uh, Tim uh, Keller. Ugh. Yeah, I, I do remember that. The uh, I think it was like a communion communion ballet dance with these dudes in hyper tight white tights. Um, yeah, I, and it was supposed to be representative of the Trinity. Ugh. Yeah, and I remember Tim Just, Keller like trying to defend it, and I was like, "This is the gayest thing that I have ever seen. This is horrible." <laughs> yeah. So I, I, yeah, I definitely think of stuff like that. Um, I think of particularly recently, like uh, Mark Dever, Russell Moore, Tim Keller. You mentioned um, in the way these guys in the past election cycle, the last four years, really came out against anything populist. Um, if you love your nation, you're sinning against God, you're, you know, a racist. They really jumped on that train, which I thought was really interesting. You can look at guys like R.L. Dabney. Can you imagine telling like Stonewall Jackson or R.L. Dabney that, hey, if you love your country, you're a pagan God-hating racist, Um, which they would say to those guys. But that's not the historic faith. Like to love your nation was not sin. Um, We, you, you know that, but that's a change we've seen. So I think that's part of the the downgrade. A lot of those guys, uh, Mark Dever included, Tim Keller, like they came out and they're like, "Well, yeah, I'm a registered Democrat, but it's only for strategic reasons." And you're like, "Yeah, right. I, I don't buy it for a second. Um, some of those guys had good ministries for a long time. Mark Dever, Nine Marks. Well, listen, they produce, you know, Ron Burns, Tabidianwa Bile, and they still support that guy. And his stuff is, man, it is straight heresy. It's garbage. It's trash. That any one of those guys would support him is beyond me. So that's part of it. And I think, again, that's significant because early on in my formative years, those guys were kind of like the popular Calvinist, you know, teachers. I think the other ones that that are... Everybody was going to. Yeah, they were huge. Them and Mark and Matt Chandler. Yeah. And, And like all those guys have drifted way, way, way far left. So then you had uh, J.D. Greer. I think this is significant because he's, again, the president of the SBC. You've got his uh, equivocating on homosexuality, um, wanting to adopt critical race theory into the one of their amendments at the SBC convention. Uh, again, like, why? Why are we supporting all this garbage? Why are we supporting critical race theory? I think the other one I would say is is the way that uh, egalitarianism and complementarian thinking um, have really gone unchallenged in the church. So look at if just go to any reformed church, go to a reformed church, reformed PCA church and say, just stand up, you know, in the announcement time and say, I just want everybody to know I, I love patriarchy. 
I love biblical patriarchy. What would happen? Like people's hair the, would light the on fire. that you couldn't <laughs> yeah. see hidden under yeah. the pews are going to come out. That's right. You feel a sharp pain in your back and some old lady stabbing you because you, you obviously love to beat women. I mean, you just said patriarchy. Mm-hmm. So I would say look at the church and the fact that nobody even put up a fight. Nobody even mm. put up a fight about biblical categories of father rule. So that that's a huge one. And then finally, I would say, particularly like in the PCA, um, the PCA has done nothing meaningful to discipline anyone after revoice. And if you, yep. lo- if you look at the inside of those situations, uh, why? Well, because the guy in charge of the committee is older— he has a nice church and a nice job and a nice retirement coming to him from the PCA, and he did not want to ruffle feathers. Right? That is the epitome of, like, well, softness mm-hmm. has taken over the church. Can you imagine going back to guys like Athanasius and being like, yeah, this Arius guy is not very good, but you know what? I have a really nice pension coming. Well, for most of those guys, it was like, look, the, we grew up. they grew up in a world where the culture hated them. They knew they were probably going to be martyred at some point. And so they're like, I can't live my life in the fear of man. Well, today it's it's far different. You know, you're a 30-year tenured pastor sure. at a church. Like, you better watch what you say, you know. And there are certain issues that guys are right. just not going to deal with head on. Right. And, and sadly, those guys do have something to lose. They do. And it's... It, it, and and that's the, that's the piece for me in this that it, at least for me I have a sort of mental struggle with is like I, I am uh, in the PCA I am a member of a, a solid PCA church here in my area I love my pastors love my church um, but I recognize at the same time that you know when you're vested into the denomination's retirement plan or whatever else it may be you do genuinely have something to lose and it's it's messed up, at least in my opinion, that we're in a place where you could legitimately lose that because of a stand you take related to revoice or side B Christianity or any of these things. And look, I've been through this fight. I was, I came to Christ in a a conservative church that was part of a very liberal denomination and we were part of the emerging church. Right. Uh, So I came to Christ in an ELCA church. Yeah. And you know, 2009, 2010, we start ordaining gay, gay clergy I'm involved in that fight at the Senate level, you know, in, in our state. It, and so I recognize that if you take this stand, you are going to lose something. Yeah. And so I hate it for those guys that they're going to lose that. But at the same time, Christ didn't call you to keep these things. He called you to be faithful. Yeah. And so you've, you've got to be willing to, to take the heat. Yeah, it really brings you back to the gospel, doesn't it? I mean, I, yeah. I had this experience while preaching one time. And uh, we had, at the time, we ha- we were down to one elder. So I'm preaching, we have one elder, and there's a sin issue I have to address in this guy's life. And I was actually, I was meeting with an Assemblies of God pastor. And I was like, I was like, you, you feel the tension here. Like, if I address this sin, it could blow up. It like likely will. And then I will be looking for a job. And I went to seminary, and my main work is this. And so right. my, I'm going to be without a job because I have to discipline this this issue. And I'll never forget it. It was just such a powerful moment. The, the AG pastor looked me in the eyes and he said, do you serve man or do you serve God? Mm. And I was like, and it was, it, for me, it was very humbling because here I am with my reformed theology and my high, you know, my high theology. Mm-hmm. And just a brother in Christ reminding me like, look, this is what Christ called you to. Like, take up your cross and follow me. Hey, guess what? You want to follow Jesus? Get a cross, like an instrument of death right. and crucifixion. That's not... People read that passage today, and they're like, well, that is a cute metaphor for my throw pillow. No, that is the the dictum for your life. And so I've had to live right. that over and over. It's like, you're gonna if you speak the truth, and you're faithful, and you speak the truth in love, and you confront homosexuality, and you confront sexual sins, you will have a wake of people who are, do not like you at all but that's okay oh unquestionably god approves and and that should matter to you more um and and we just again we need churches and we need pastors who are just training that their men this way um training men that when you're in the Mm. corporate space like the mantra of living as a christian in the world is not keep your head down and don't let them know what you really believe like hide it 
you know, mm. uh, we need to be bold. We need to be salt. We need to be light. Absolutely. So when we think about this downgrade, do you see a connection between what you and I are talking about right now and the, the utter dearth of blue collar guys, particularly in reformed and Presbyterian churches? Uh, so, you know, the guys that have got oil under their fingernails and mud on their boots, we don't seem to have those guys in our churches. Yeah, it, I think it's a great point. Um, years ago, I wrote, this is kind of where the Hard Men podcast started, but I wrote a, an article on my website, which was titled, like, Hard Men in a World of Softness, I think. And mm. um, I honestly, I, I was reading The Grace of Shame, which is a book by Tim and Joseph Bailey, and um, really dealing with sexual sins, right? How to, how to lovingly call homosexuals to repent. And as a process of reading that book, I just kind of had this moment where I was like, you know, I have this crazy thought, like I've been through seminary and I've been through the church and there's a lot of white collar people and working people are turned off by the church. And I almost, it's funny. Like I almost didn't write the, the post. Cause I was like, no, this is dumb. I think maybe I'm just making this up. And I thought, you know what? No, I'm going to write this short article. Well, I wrote it um, and then like prominent people started sharing it. And I think in like three days it had like 270,000 page views. And I was like, oh, wow. Whoa. And it really that was the first moment where I realized, hey, maybe this is a real issue. Uh, maybe this is not just something that I'm making up. And really the heart of what I was seeing was you would get these white collar pastors and you would send them to these small rural towns. Mm hmm. And it was like they hated each other because all the working men in the church, like where we, we were we were at, is like they're coal miners. They work oil and gas pipelines. They're hunters. And I remember having a conversation with one of one of the guys who was in the ministry. And um, I was like, yeah, there's a ton of people in town because it's hunting season. You know, we mm -hmm. th this is how small towns are in Western, you know, Western part of the U.S. during that time sure. of year. And he was like, oh, I hate hunting. It just disgusts me. And these people and their stupid guns. And he kind of like went off, you know, country music. And ugh. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking what struck me about it is like he wasn't wrong about everything. But there was a True. real disdain for working men. Mm -hmm. And the irony is working men are one of the last bastions of masculinity. So I think if you unpack the phenomenon of Donald Trump... Uh, getting elected to the presidency it, it in the populism. The weird thing about working men is like they feel all of that. The the make America great, the love for country, uh, the, the wanting to end immigration, mm -hmm. illegal immigration, all of it. They feel that stuff all in their bones. They can't articulate it in a in a 10,000 word essay, but they protect that right. stuff like it's their life. But because it is in their blood. And I think that mm -hmm. as you've watched these like leftist pastors go further left, like who, who does Russell Moore really have to distance himself from Trump supporters? If the leftist yeah. elites are going to love Russell Moore like he wants, he has to distance himself from Trump supporters. So this is a phenomenon I've seen for the last five to 10 years in, in reformed churches where they go out of their way to be quote unquote apolitical. You know, they go out of right. their way to be like, oh, no, 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 we're not those jerk conservatives. We're compassionate Christians. We we welcome. Mm -hmm. We're welcoming, you know, and and because of that, I think those working men have like fled from churches. Uh, of Sure. One of the prominent guys um, in reformed evangelicalism, I remember him saying to me, he said, listen, your article was so big because. Reformed churches, like, we do not have the American working man, by and large. Like, we're white-collar, we're engineers, we're doctors, and that's great. And, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with, like, that type of person being in the church. But you do have to look at it and say, why are we losing plumbers? There's right. something about our message. Because, look, Jesus was ministering to those guys. He was ministering to Peter, who, you know, pulled a fishing net his whole life. OK, he was not right. Ivy League trained. So what is it about the message <laughs> now that's changed that we don't we don't attract, identify those guys don't identify with us? 
Yeah, I there I think there's something to that and I can't put my finger on all the pieces of it, but I think that there is something I don't know, deeply unhealthy about yeah. the fact that we're not able to speak to working class guys and that's you know not unlike you that's my background so i grew right. up in the deep south uh you know hunting fishing uh crabbing shrimping the whole nine yards um and as i've said you know everybody hates southerners and their gun culture <laughs> right up until a war zone yeah right and then, and then they're the like we're going zone, to everybody texas loves a rip. <laughs> yeah yeah they will like just get every man from you know texas east yeah uh and south of virginia and indiana and we'll let those guys go fight the war yep um, so I think there is something going on there, but man, I, I think that's a, that's a deep well to try and find the bottom of. So I, I don't know that, I don't know that you and I are going to do anything more than scratch the surface on that. Um, yeah. So in this vein, once again, uh, do you see a connection between the downgrade that we're talking about and the just atrocious theology, uh, and bad doctrine that we see in, uh, kind of broadly evangelical churches. And and if you do see a connection there, can you talk a little bit about what that connection is, at least in your opinion? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I definitely do. Um, you know, again, I think with Ann Douglas, like she un, really unpacked that well was that when you have soft theology, you have soft churches and you have mm. feminization. And so it's always it's always interesting to me too because there's like this idea this modern idea that you know men men's men don't really like theology and i've actually found the opposite like what they don't like is your emotional sappiness that has no content whatsoever what they don't like is showing up to church and it's like an hour of like story time like get into the meat of the Mm -hmm. text talk about what the text means preach it apply it to them in meaningful ways that is relevant to their life Men are, as I've seen, are generally all about that. Um, so, mm-hmm. and then I would connect it too again with what Ann, Ann Douglas uh, mentioned was the, the downgrade in Calvinism. So, early 1800s in America, you had Unitarianism, um, a lot of those really bad heretical teachings. They become very popular, and because of that, there's a direct correlation to the what's happening with masculinity and and feminism. Um, Many of the leaders, in fact, of the Unitarian Church, the the women, you know, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and others are Mm -hmm. Unitarian, tied to Unitarianism, tied to other leftist churches and ideologies. So, again, if I would I would contend, like if you had robust theology and it was being defended and proclaimed proudly in the midst of all of this, that's probably where the men would have rallied. Um, mm. Again, I think it gets back to men and women's minds, mm. uh, women being more emotional, nurturing, um, you know, wanting to smooth over relationships, uh, whereas men are there. I mean, anybody you can look at like, you know, secular psychology and they'll be like, yeah, I don't know. Men are just more aggressive and willing to fight over something. A lot of times that's right. actually this is what people don't understand things like truth and doctrine should be fought over. Like there is a time, like even, even in modern Christianity, like we have a hard time understanding, like how could a church leader see another church leader, like fornicating in a tent and take a spear and go run that spear through the both of them. Right. What would happen today? If like anything even remotely like that happened, what if, what if a pastor just published like, public like hey this guy's doing this they'd be like well you know that's right. private yeah what if somebody had come out early on and said this is what's happening with Ravi Zacharias oh man yeah wow yeah that and 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 what you would have seen is like people are defending Ravi Zacharias and if you mm-hmm. said anything bad about him which people did by the way a lot of people were like he has fake credentials you know he yeah. keeps i was on that train early on really yeah, and so I remember like reading that even I, myself. I read it and I was like, uh, maybe these people are just they just don't like how popular he is. But, but it was absolutely back true. When, yeah, well, I mean, back when I was still blogging uh, pseudonymously, shall we say, uh, I wasn't blogging under my own name. It was a team blog, 
and I started talking about some of that, and the backlash that I got was shocking. Really? Uh, because, and this was, like, for me, one of the central things was, you know, he claimed to be, and this was before we knew anything about the sexual scandal part of this. This is just on the credentials piece of it. Right. Was he was claiming to be a visiting scholar at Cambridge University. And when I saw that, I was like, wait a minute, I know how that works. Like, I know how you become a visiting scholar at Cambridge University. And what he's describing isn't how that works. That's not what that is. And then started digging a little bit deeper. And it was like, wait a minute, this guy only has honorary doctorates. And, you know, it was like a doctor of divinity. And so I was trying to explain to some people in my life why this was a problem. I was like, you, you don't understand. If you're in the U.K., and you receive a Doctor of Divinity degree in the UK, that's a legitimate academic degree there because right. it's based on a lifetime body of theological work that's, you know, right. through 40 years. Here, it's honorary. It was like, and the thing that's ticking me off about this is that he's from India. He's a product of the British uh, educational system. Right. He knows he's lying. Right. And nobody was willing to call this out loudly except for an atheist and a handful of guys that couldn't blog on their, under their own name because we didn't want to lose everything we had. Right. And that's the situation we found ourselves in. So, no, you're right. I mean, if, if guys stand up and start talking about some of this stuff and call out church leaders that are doing those sorts of things, you're going to pay a high price. Yeah, and I, I think that's um, – the, the irony is like – so I went to Southern Seminary. And somebody like Al Mohler, they were like, we're all about preaching the truth. I mean, expositional preaching there was like, we talked about that and talked about that and talked about that. But but I, I'll always look back at it, and I think of something that Don Whitney said, one of the professors there. And he said, yeah, the, the hard thing is not convincing people that they need to be expositionally preaching. The hard thing mm -hmm. is convincing them that what they're doing is not expositional preaching. And, oh, and what yeah. it... What it really unpacked for me was like, you can talk about something and talk about something, but at the end of the day, if if your best friend, C.J. Mahaney, you're covering for yeah. him while he's embroiled in scandal, like right. child sexual sins like that he helped cover up, and yep. all that stuff I can say now is like, they've like that's been proven. Like, you did this stuff, man. Yeah. Where did Al right. Mohler come out and say, you know what, I'm sorry. I, I defended somebody who did something really wrong. No, they don't. And so I think it, it's, it's because we, put, we, we don't actually put a premium on the truth. In Christian culture, we put a premium on celebrity. And, and the 11th oh, yeah. commandment, especially in the SBC, is you do not speak ill of a prominent churchman, which is why you yep. have to talk about Ravi Zacharias with a pseudonym, you know, Right. Um, the number yeah, of that's exactly it. The number of people I know, Adam Robles, Ad Robles. Um, you know, he, he had his kind of YouTube video stuff where he was, you know, pointing out some of these issues. And before long, like Russ Moore in the ERLC, ERLC is calling his church and having him removed from office because he's speaking out on these issues. Right? It's like. Yeah. Do you really love the truth? And so, again, I would say that comes back to your issue of we have bad theology. We love celebrity mm -hmm. culture status. That's something we're told in Corinthians is a bad formula for a church. And oh, yeah. lo and behold, if Herman Melville is right, and I think he is, that the pulpit leads the world, well, no wonder the culture is a dumpster fire. We're a dumpster fire. Mm-hmm. So w w we see the downgrade, I think, at this point, you know, 45 minutes into the show. Uh, <laughs> yeah. the, the evidence is in front of us. So what is it that local churches can be doing to fight this downgrade? Yeah, it's a, it's a phenomenal question. Um, one thing that I always tell guys is, like, start where you are, start small. Uh, one of the first things you personally can do, maybe you're an elder, maybe you're in a church, um, is get a copy of Zach Garris's book, Masculine Christianity. And I would just encourage people to read it. I think for most people, it's going to challenge them. Zach does a, a wonderful job of unpacking biblical sexuality in a way that mm -hmm. kind of is like a slap in the face to the modern church. And then I would say like, okay, you read it, you address issues in your life where your life doesn't align with the scripture on those issues. 
and then you 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 know you, maybe you take it to the pastors of the church maybe you are an elder so you take it to your pastor maybe you're the pastor you take it to your your session um but just mm-hmm. start sharing that with people praying over it um, remember that like in the book of Acts, like as God is doing things, we, we really need God to do things communally. Like we need reformation, uh, right? We're reformed. Mm-hmm. And so we need God to do a rebuilding work. And so he's got to get the hearts and minds of the people. Um, and he's got to get them by the spirit moving in the same direction. So, you know, even mm-hmm. on my podcast, I shared Zach's book. We, uh, we had Zach on and it's been crazy. Like I think Zach said he had, at, at one point he had sold like 500 copies he and I, like you have all these people now reading it. Um, he's come on other podcasts. Uh, he's going to be on yours, John Harris, Michael Foster, all this stuff. And all of a sudden people are talking about it and people are saying, we need this in our churches. So mm-hmm. just don't be afraid and, and like have faith and start small. And, and the kingdom is like a mustard seed. That's a really good resource. Uh, there's a lot of other ones. Um, the stuff that you're producing, Michael Foster, It's Good to Be a Man, you can check out my mm-hmm. stuff. Check out Zach Garris's website. Start sharing this information with your friends and start finding groups of people that you can read this stuff together, that you can hold each other accountable. Um, I've talked a lot about local gangs or groups of men. Um, we, we need to think locally and then get those people together, be reading the same stuff, talking about it, and then putting together action plans for what, what could we change in our church? Maybe... And I was talking to one pastor, and he's like, you know what? I got that book. I read it, and I am going to do a sermon series, like a six-week series on, like, masculinity. And I was like, amen. Mm-hmm. That beautiful. And start addressing these issues. That's great. That is a wonderful place to start. And then finally, I would say, this is more at a personal level, but, like, start disciplining your own life and start, if you have, like, if you're a father, if you have children, start disciplining your family, your your concentric circles of relationships moving out from yourself you need to confront Mm -hmm. sin where you see it on these sexual issues and then you just need to speak plainly and deal with it god created fathers to create order in a world of chaos when paul looks at the church Mm -hmm. in chaos he says titus go and appoint elders because elders are fathers and fathers know how to create order in a world of chaos so start there and just start ordering your own existence well as a father and then you, you'll be surprised what happens from that other people will see it you can help your friends etc but if nothing else you will have repented and that's always a good place mm-hmm. to start indeed well folks that's actually going to be it for this episode of the true presbyterian but i would invite you guys stick around because uh we're getting ready to go into our after the interview uh, segment, and uh, I'm going to be running something by Eric on the hunting front, so y'all hang around for that. Also, feel uh, please feel free, go to uh, www.patreon.com slash thetruepresby, where you can become a patron of the podcast for as little as $5 a month, which is dang near free. Y'all have a good day. <laughs>